Hi, I'm Mike Coyle, and you're watching Inside Exploration. Today, I'm here with President and CEO Vance White and Exploration Manager Wayne Homestead of Noble Mineral Exploration, listed on the TSX Venture under NOB. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Great to be Hello. here, Mike. So you guys have been pretty busy with acquiring projects. You gave the market a really nice update yesterday, and I kind of want to go over a few of those projects, but I want to start with, you know, where Noble kind of started with Project 81. So as part of Project 81, you've been re most recently exploring the Dargaville area. So Vance, why don't you give us a little bit of insight as to how that drill program went, what you were trying to identify, and when can we kind of expect to see some results from that? Well, basically, the program was put together to follow up on some drilling that was done in uh, 2020. And uh, there was a series of six holes that were to have been put in there. And we're just waiting now on and have been advised by the uh, by the lab that results that were submitted or the uh, samples that were submitted in uh, January, the results of which should be available within the next 10 to 14 days. Okay, so you finalized. So Wayne, maybe, Wayne, maybe you might want to comment on, uh, on uh, what the purpose of that program was as to following up a gold trend that was initially discovered. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the 2020 drilling identified a gold trend, as, uh, as Vance said. Uh, the, um, uh, they, they, they got, uh, they intersected gold values and I think five out of, uh, out of the six holes. And uh, we and over quite a quite a long, I think, ten kilometers plus of of strike length. And the purpose of the 2022 program was to drill in between these holes and uh, and try to uh, extend the, uh, the the known mineralization. So, how did the cores look? Well, we had lots of sulfides. We it seems to be controlled by a sulfide uh, based iron formation. And and we hit lots of sulfides, and uh, but you can't tell. Do you get your analyses whether you whether you got gold or not? As Vance likes to say, the truth is in the ground. So Vance, also Project Eighty One, you just cut a big deal with uh, Canada Nickel. Um, you've optioned off a bunch of properties. You've got some JV uh, properties there going. Why don't you give the uh, market a, a general feel for putting that deal together and finalizing that? Well, basically, our philosophy with Ken and nickel has always been right from the get-go that anything that had a sort of nickel uh, potential uh, and ultramafics has been identified by uh, Mark and uh, Steve Balsh of Ken and nickel. It only made sense for all of those uh, lands to be held by uh, Ken and nickel. Now, we have retained a 2% NSR on the claims that were staked by Noble, and those claims are in Mahaffey Township, Dermot Township, Calder, Calder and uh, uh, Bradburn Townships. Now, also on top of that, we put together a package of lands in Mann Township, uh, Hannah, Realm, and Duff Township, which we have optioned to uh, Canada Nickel, uh, whereby all of the underlying uh, option agreements with the various optioners that make up part of that parcel uh, all of the work commitments and uh, costs associated with that have been passed on to Canada Nickel to a point where should they all be met, and that would include uh, a number of $100,000 per year payments as well as um, approximately a million seven hundred thousand in work commitments over the course of four years, would earn a, uh, an 80% interest after which it would then become an 80-20 uh, joint venture. Uh, with respect to the underlying NSRs on the very, with the various optioners, we have a buyback right on that, uh, half of which we have uh, on sold to Canada Nickel. But Noble's also retained a 2% NSR on all of the state claims that Noble staked in those various uh, townships. So we look forward to uh, Canada Nickel going ahead with uh, initially an airborne uh, project, uh, which we understand is to take place sometime early summer. And that would meet the work requirements uh, by the end of uh, 2022 under under the uh, terms of the underlying option agreement that we have with Canada Nickel. Well, I must commend you, Vance. You did a, a marvelous job with Project 81, bringing in 
Canada Nickel and now them advancing the project it kind of flows with the whole project generator model. So congratulations on that front. But <clears throat> Project 81 was more than just nickel. There's an awful lot of really nice looking nickel targets there, but the proximity to the Kid Creek mine and the fact that nothing's ever been found. I mean, we've talked about this before, but Wayne, now that you're involved, this is going to go towards you. Um, now that you're involved, have you had an opportunity to look at the Carnegie townships um, and kind of assess where you might want to start poking some holes for potential VMS targets? Yes, there's, uh, there's an area in uh, sort of central Carnegie township that looks to me to be quite quite interesting where they uh, in the past they did some overburden drilling and right at the bedrock uh, till interface they got some very good values in copper zinc gold and and even nickel um the, this didn't seem to have been followed up by by diamond drilling and with the overburden drilling they only went so far into the bedrock so that's that's where it sits in addition there was a, a hole drilled by hollinger that uh, intersected a really nice package of uh, quartz carbonate alteration, brecciation, has all the ingredients that looks like it could be uh, a gold host, um, but they, did, they didn't include the analyses for, for gold in there. They didn't include any analyses uh, with the log. So, so we're, we're, we're planning on probably twinning that hole and, and seeing, seeing what comes out of it. Excellent. So you've also identified this big, beautiful boulder that you announced the other day. And thank you for writing and doing that right up. Uh, we published it through Inside Exploration, if anybody's interested on the history of the boulder. But why don't you give us a little bit of rundown and how you came across that boulder and, and what's where you're at with this project right now? Well, that's, that, that's, that's, that's quite an interesting story. And it's, uh, you know, like a lot of discoveries or, or uh, stories in mining. It was a whole series of coincidences. And uh, it turns out that the uh, uh, local landowner uh, near, the, near the town of Hearst was, was digging a, uh, uh, a watering pit for, for his animals. And he came across this great big huge boulder that he pulled out with the machine and, and laid it out uh, on the side there. And, and he also collected rocks, which was, which was good because he, he, he noticed that this particular boulder looked very interesting and very, very unusual. And, uh, and so he, so he laid it out on side and it rained and, and cleaned off the boulder and he kept looking at it and looking at it. And, and it, by the way, it's 140 kilograms. So, so he pulled his pickup truck in there and with the tractor managed to get it on the back of his pickup truck and took it to his garage and, and uh, it sat there for 20 years. And whenever, <laughs> whenever somebody would come to his house, he'd, he'd, He'd say, "Well, come see my boulder," and uh, and they look at it and they go, "Well, that's interesting," and then then they walk away. But one one guy that he talked to uh, said, "Well, why don't you take that into the Timmins resident geologist office and see what they think of it? Maybe you know, maybe it has something in it." So he lo uh, he he took a piece of the the boulder into Ed Van Hees, who was the resident geologist uh, for Timmins at the time. And Ed looked at it and thought, well, that looks pretty strange. He thought it was, it was some sort of iron formation. And when he found out where it came from, he said, well, you know, it can't be anything too economic because Hearst doesn't have any base metal mines. So, so he sent it away for analysis and it came back 72% copper to his great surprise, as well as uh, precious metal content and uh, zinc and uh, lead and silver, 252 grams of silver. Um, so he decided to go out and look at the boulder. So he drove to, uh, to Andre's house and, and they, they looked at the boulder and, and that's, that's, that's how the story all started. So they, he, he went back and at the end of the year, he has to write a summary of visits that he'd made. And, and he wrote up a one page, uh, uh, article on, on the boulder and put in a picture of it and, uh, and uh, and th and that was it. And then 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 I was uh, leafing through his report, and I and I saw the boulder, and I go, "Whoa, that looks pretty." <laughs> mm. <laughs> Somebody must have followed up on this. There there has to be there has to be something on it. And then we were at the, at the time we were going right into COVID, and uh, so I called up Andre, and I said I said, 
I said, has anybody looked into that boulder? He says, well, a few people called me, but nothing materialized. I said, okay, hang on. I'm going to sign a contract with you and don't tell anybody else about the boulder and uh, I'll make, make you, I'll send you a bit of money. And that's, that's how it all started. Good on you. So Vince, you sent a team up there exploring. I'm sure once you got eyes on this boulder, you're pretty excited about it too. Uh, what was the determination of the work that you did in 2021? Well, the work that was carried out was under the uh, guidance of uh, Ed Van Hees, who has uh, retired from his position as the resident geologist. And, he, and Wayne sent a team up that uh, carried out a, a number of uh, basal till sampling, uh, of which the uh, results were sent off, or the samples were sent off to ODM for uh, reporting on. We got the, the results back in, in the early part of 2022. And it indicates that uh, we want to go forward with a, a very large staking program, which we did. Uh, we have uh, gone. We have engaged a uh, and are contracting a uh, modern, up-to-date uh, geophysical program. Part of the program that was carried out uh, last fall was with the with the um, a glacial uh, expert from. Uh, Massachusetts from the U.S. who came up and gave us some direction as to what the glacial trains uh, were with respect to that area and we married that up with some early uh, geophysics and that led us to uh, the acreage that uh, we wanted to see. So we've got a, I think it's in the order of about 4,500 hectares up there now and that's uh, going to be, uh, we're going to have a, an airborne uh, program carried out on that in the early part, early midsummer of uh, this year in this field season. And that will be followed up with a, uh, a drill program probably later in the, uh, in the fall. So just to clarify, this boulder was not found on surface. It was actually found underground when the gentleman who found it was digging a pit, correct? Correct. It was, it was about 10 feet down. Okay. Second, you're doing a glaciation trail on this to, to try to figure out where it came from this boulder's heavy how far could it really have traveled like let's be honest here what, what's your thoughts well based on the place on based on the glaze the till sampling that we did uh they were they were counting gold grains uh in in the till samples and they did contain gold grains and uh and some of them were what's called pristine which means they, it, it's basically a gold grain with points on it yeah. and uh and some of them were like that so that indicate that normally indicates a source within 100 200 meters so so that's what we're going on right now so you're you're pretty hopeful that you're going to find the source of this boulder very close by then is that safe to say well that's that's the idea uh we you should mention that the um th that area hasn't been explored at all since uh Algoma was there in the 1960s and they were looking for iron ore. And, I mean, the uh, other so obvious, the, the other obvious thing with respect to this is you're looking at the gold equivalent of 138 grams per ton, or pretty close <laughs> to twelve thousand dollars Canadian per ton. I mean, if you find if you found even a small deposit with those kind of values, huge, be significant and very significant. Talk about a return on investment. Your stock would be flying. I'm not going to yeah. say it aware, but it would be flying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen, Boulder sounds really intriguing. I wish you the best of luck on that project. Uh, my understanding, we're going to try to make our way up there in the next month and uh, do a little expose on this uh, on this Boulder property. So looking forward to that. Let's talk about Nagagami. This is one that I've been watching with great interest. Seems like you're, you're going to have an opportunity to poke a few holes in this thing as where other people haven't necessarily. So talk to us a little bit about the Nagagami project. Let me first begin by saying that the we, we staked was about 14,000 hectares up there. And this was following on uh, what Wayne had uh, been able to determine in comparison with the Niobec, uh, Niobium River uh, uh, geophysics in uh, Quebec. So the first thing that we did was open up uh, the communications with the Constance Lake First Nation. Uh, we've had uh, two virtual meetings with them. Uh, we have exchanged uh, an expiration uh, permit agreement, or expiration agreement rather, and uh, I expect that uh, they're going to have an in-council 
a meeting sometime in early early this month, if not this week. And we will follow that up with a, a further uh, consultation. Basically, their business uh, manager or the, the party that's responsible for the business relative to the uh, First Nation is on side with moving forward. They have had uh, exploration agreements with other uh, mineral exploration uh, companies. And consequently, I feel that we're going to be in a position where we can uh, make a final determination on that sometime over the next few, few weeks. That being the case, then the uh, next step there would be to uh, organize a, uh, uh, a drill program initially to test uh, for niobium and uh, rare, earth, rare earth elements. Uh, that likely will not take place. We had hoped we'd be able to get in there early part of the summer, but there is a shortage of uh, helicopters and a shortage of rigs, you know, given all of the acti activity that's taking place in the field. But we do have a, a helicopter lined up for the end of the summer, early September. And at that time, we would expect that uh, we'll put in a number of holes there just to determine the nerve. You know, our philosophy has always been to take these either unexplored or underexplored uh, areas. Uh, and if you're going to find an elephant, it's going to be in these areas that are have been untested at this point in time. Now, we have a, a, a good idea, and Wayne can address this with respect to certain of the drilling that was done by Algoma, Algoma uh, Iron Ore was to test for an iron formation or, or, or an iron ore supply. Uh, they did not test the uh, Meglo in this uh, anomaly, and consequently, although there was one drill hole, I think that did come back with some niobium or niobium mm -hmm. with a pentoxide. I think it's, I think it is. Yeah, they drilled a fence across the. They started out in the magnetic high on the uh, margin of the uh, of the complex, and and got and intersected a lot of uh, magnetite. But I guess they didn't determine that it was it was worthwhile as far as, you know from a from an iron mining uh, perspective. They uh, drilled one or two holes on the edge of the magnetic low and did get some indication that there was uh, niobium there. But you gotta uh, that remember that got to remember that this was done 60, 70 years ago too. Yeah, a long time ago, and they they were testing all their ground for uh, for iron formation. All they, they at the time they. They owned a lot of ground in the area, and uh, and they were testing all all their ground. And there certainly for iron, there were certainly some better targets than this one, but um, they they weren't necessarily looking for the rare earth, especially rare earths. But they weren't looking for the niobium either. One thing that should be mentioned is uh, is that uh, we um, we our exploration permit that we submitted to the government, and they in turn submitted it to Constance first. Uh, nation uh, has been approved by the government, which means that the uh, Constance First Nation uh, ha gave it a go ahead. So how does Noble go about exploring this? Do you have to drill a hole right down the center of the mag low, like straight down, or do you have to cross Pretty, pretty much. It's, it, it, it's, covered, it's covered by uh, overburden. It's covered by Paleozoic rocks, much younger rocks. Uh, so we have to drill th through those. They're, they seem to be uh, thinner farther south you go so we're going to try some test holes down to the south and basically just drill right into the core of this thing and see see what comes out of it oh, i'm excited for it i think you got something there it, it certainly looks very similar to that niobec mine that uh that you've offered some similarities to in previous conversations all right gentlemen newfoundland you got yourself a nice little looking property there next to Spruce Ridge. And I'm curious about what the plan of attack for that is. I know you want to do some airborne stuff and um, do you plan on, or are you hopeful to get any drills in the ground out there this year? I think that from my perspective, uh, what we've done is we've liaised with uh, Spruce Ridge such that we can uh, share the MOB and DMOB for an airborne program. I, I understand that they want to go ahead with a, an airborne program, uh, geophysical program on the east side of their uh, Great Burn. Uh, we want to go ahead with an airborne program on the west side of their uh, Great Burn uh, project area. And so uh, we've uh, had a, uh, a virtual meeting between uh, their geo, Wayne, and uh, Steve Balsh, the geophysicist, with respect to what the timing would be on that. And 
uh, how we can go forward with it, but it looks like it's going to be probably late summer. What are your thoughts, Wayne? Well, this, this, this property was, the, the government mapped it as sediments, and, uh, but um, Steve Balch and uh, Kevin Ralph looked at, uh, there, there's magnetic anomalies in it, which, which you, don't, you don't normally find in, in the sedimentary rocks there. And so that's, that's what attracted their attention to it. And it, in addition, it's, a, it's an area that's seen very little exploration in the past. So once again, it's, you know, falls under the category of underexplored and, uh, and falls into our, our category of uh, property that requires additional work. Well, if you've never flown over the center of Newfoundland, you'll know that it's a very barren la landscape. And uh, it's, it's nothing short of rock. And I understand why they call it the rock now. So that, that area looks really nice uh, from the air. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with it. So Vance, uh, we've talked about your project generator model, but it seems like since Wayne's come on board, you've kind of shifted your focus to become doing, a, or maybe not become, but doing a little more exploration work before you seek out joint ventures. Um, what's has Wayne's influence in the company changed your overall strategy in the market? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you got to take a look. Uh, you know, when we first picked up Project 81, the first thing we did was to have Steve Balsh come in and, and fly the entire area. And the reason we got involved in the uh, Project 81 initially was uh, former VP Exploration Randy Singh had identified a drill hole that Inco had put down in the 1960s in Kingsville Township, which returned a thousand plus feet of 0 0.25, 0 0.26, 0 0.27 nickel. Mm -hmm. And it was based on that. And the, none of this stuff had been filed with the, uh, with the ministry at that point. And we were able to go through the reports that were dropped off at the, at the ministry and not at that point in time had they been cataloged, but we were able to negotiate the acquisition of, of the property from uh, Abbey, uh, Abitibi Bowater. But you got to remember that at, when, when I first made that phone call, it was to Abitibi Bullwater when they were in a receivership position. And it wasn't until, and that was done in uh, 2010, and it wasn't until 2011 that we were able to uh, come to terms and bring in Franklin, Nevada as a financial uh, backer in order to make the acquisition from Abitibi And the first thing we did was to initiate the consultation process with the uh, Wabin Tribal Council for the metagamy and the Metachuan First Nations, and we followed that up with uh, the TDN uh, a consultation with them. But then <clears throat> the first initial uh, process that we went through was for uh, an airborne project over the entire uh, Project 81 area. We followed that up with a drill program both in Kingsville and Lucas. So this is not, from uh, our perspective, divergent from that of being a project generator. I mean, the philosophy is look for these under or unexplored uh, areas that have uh, geological potential uh, or some early work that was done 50, 60, 70 years ago that has not in any way, shape or form been followed up on. And so it's consistent in that regard. And so what we'll do is we'll go out and we'll carry out either an airborne or a, an airborne with a follow-up uh, drill program to the point where it's of interest to bringing in other parties as uh, an option uh, joint venture partnership. So Buckingham, you've got this great graphite property. Um, I know that you want to do a little bit of exploration work down there. Uh, what's the plan for Buckingham for this year? Well, the uh, wings just in the process of preparing the budget for that, but it would likely include uh, infill drilling and then the, the drill testing of an untested target that's on strike and within the property uh, boundaries. And you got to remember that this is a, a, a very easily accessible uh, project area. It's in the province of Quebec, uh, where there's a stress for critical minerals and battery related minerals. On top of which, you've just seen from the uh, federal and provincial governments in both Ontario and Quebec, the announcements related to the establishment of two battery manufacturing facilities, one in Windsor and one in the, just outside of Montreal. And those are going to need if they're going to be on online by 2025, 26, they're going to need uh, feedstock. And uh, if you're looking at uh, the Crawford deposit of Canada nickel, 
it would fit right into that uh, into that category. Now they they'll have their feasibility study by the end of this year. They've had uh, improved grades, improved recoveries, uh, good sized tonnage. Uh, they've also got the uh, byproducts of uh, the PGMs and uh, cobalt in that deposit. I mean, you got to take a look at this. I can recall in the early 70s when I was in the investment business, we were financing uh, the low-grade porphyry coppers uh, out west. And mm -hmm. the, a number of analysts said, well, you know, with those low grades, you're not going to be, be able to make it. Well, the same holds true here. I mean, the one knock that uh, you see uh, you know, put together in the, in the marketplace relates to the grade. Well, I say to them, everything related to grade is a function of size. And if you can get the scale up, then you're looking at numbers that uh, are going to be through the roof. Yeah, they make sense for sure. And like you say, the governments, our governments, the Ontario and Quebec governments have put a, a major push on this stuff. So do you foresee this graphite play maybe playing into that? Can you get any government funding to help accelerate these battery metal projects that you have? Because you certainly have quite a few of them now. Wayne, Wayne has looked into that relative to the, uh, the Bucking, Buckingham project as to whether there's assistance that could fall into place there. So it's, it's early stage right now that we're just getting all of those ducks in a row right now. Well, most, of the funding is, most of the funding is related to advanced projects, uh, advanced bulk sampling feasibility, and that sort of thing. There's not too much available in Quebec for the grassroots. Uh, but you do get a rebate on uh, exploration work that you do there up to 30 to 40 percent of your uh, of your expenses. So certainly it's it's still a good place to explore. Yeah, that's terrific. So finances, how, how do the books look? Vince, are you all set for this year's exploration? Well, right now we're sitting with about three million in cash and uh, probably somewhere close to eight, ten million dollars in marketable security. Excellent. All right, gentlemen. Well, let's wrap this up. Is there anything you'd like to say to your shareholders beyond what we've covered? Well, this is going to be a very interesting uh, six to 18 months in terms of the uh, expiration front. The one caveat I'd like to throw out there, though, is who knows what's going to happen with respect to all of the geopolitical events that are taking place around the world right now. It really does make for a, a challenge relative to maintaining any kind of uh, momentum market wise but nevertheless uh, we're in the business if you don't look you don't find very true well thanks for joining me today guys as always it's been a pleasure and we'll uh, we'll get you back real soon for another update great mike thanks very much you have a great day now thank you